So we've been talking a lot about measuring things in a social science context. And that returns us back to this larger question about sampling and questionnaire design. And so I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about sort of contemporary um, public opinion survey methods. Um, and then later we'll, we'll shift that conversation to fixing some of the problems that seem to have popped up in that over the years. So when we think about sampling, it's worth reminding ourselves that the best samples are random samples. Um, that's where um, you select people from a population or more specifically a target population, the, the big group that you're interested in want to generalize to, in which every person has an equal probability of being selected. And if you do that, we understand how those kind of samples behave, and we can say some things mathematically about how the results that we get from that process will relate to the larger world. And so we are oftentimes interested in getting a random sample, um, in part because of the math that sort of goes into it, but also because it helps to eliminate some of the bias that comes um, when researchers have their hands too deep into the process of selecting cases, which can um, yield results that are biased in ways that we don't necessarily understand. So we're trying to get these random samples. And when we don't have random samples, we get things like this. And this is sort of a very famous photo. And I've heard different stories um, around sort of what resulted in this bad headline, everything from, you know, the, the newspapers um, had their headlines sort of pre-printed and, and the results seemed to be tilting that way. And so it was just, you know, bad information. But, but the version that I think makes sense in terms of, of the history of sampling is that it, up until fairly recently, there was no way to get a reliable random sample of the population. Uh, for a number of years, um, public opinion sampling and, and presidential forecasting um, was done kind of informally and ad hoc. Um, there was a very popular magazine called the Literary Digest, which um, would have sort of like weekly surveys where people could fill out like a card in the back and then mail this postcard in and they would tag out the results and then you know the results would show up in the, the subsequent issue. And they had gotten into presidential election forecasting and had done okay um, until the 1930s when they predicted that Ralph Landon, Langdon, Landon um, would defeat uh, Roosevelt, which didn't happen um, in part because people who in the middle of the Great Depression continued to purchase um, the literary digest were of, we'll say, more affluent means than folks who, you know, had had let that subscription go. And so it was producing a sample that wasn't particularly accurate. But uh, in that election, um, George Gallup had actually done much better. And George Gallup used a method of quota sampling where he had a, a network of people across the country and he would say, okay, I need you to get me, you know, 50 men and 50 women from Nebraska. Um, and so somebody would go out to Nebraska and they would get 50 men and 50 women. Um, and that produced a better, more representative sample, but it wasn't really a random sample. Um, in fact, it had its own sort of biases that contributed to um, this Dewey defeats Truman headline, where if I'm a you know agent of George Gallup looking to fill out my survey forms with 50 men and 50 women, and I you know pop off the train in Lincoln, Nebraska, um, I want to get that job done as quick as I possibly can, and so I wander around the train station of Lincoln, Nebraska, and find men and women to complete my survey. And while I'm getting Nebraskans well, potentially Nebraskans, um, and while I'm getting men and women, and therefore my results are maybe more representative than maybe the Literary Digest, um, it would be, I'd be hard pressed to make a case that um, people wandering around a train station in Lincoln, Nebraska are a representative picture of Nebraskans as a whole, right? You're gonna get people who again are more affluent, people who again maybe are, are, are more educated or, or traveling, you're gonna get a lot less sort of rural farmers um, with that kind of a sampling method. And so again, we, we find ourselves when we can't sort of give everybody an equal probability of being selected in this sort of bind where we have a hard time knowing if our samples are actually telling us something useful about the world. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, the solution that sort of emerges in the 1950s um, is to use random digit dialing where we can reach the vast majority of the population because telephones become widespread and more or less every person becomes attached um, to a telephone, um, sometimes directly now with cell phones or for many years sort of through households um, that it might have multiple people but one phone line. And phone numbers are really great also for random selection because they follow a predictable pattern of numbers. And we can just use computers to randomly generate strings of numbers that look like phone numbers 
and dial those numbers and see who's on the other end. And so that works really well as a method of, um, of sampling in which pretty much everybody has the same probability being selected. Now it's gotten a little, I would say trickier, but also less tricky in recent years. Um, so one of the things that's, that's gotten a little bit better is that we've moved to a world in which pretty much every person is attached to a single uh, phone number uh, through cell phones. Whereas before, if there was one um, phone in a college dormitory, very famously college dormitories were under sampled in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, whereas families that had two you know, phone lines would be oversampled. Well, with cell phones being more or less ubiquitous, that problem has largely gone away. Uh, but we've come up against a new problem um, initially in that uh, federal law prevented polling firms from actually calling cell phones because in the olden days, um, if you had a cell plan, you paid when somebody called you. And so it was deemed that that was um, inappropriate. And so you couldn't have a computer dialing a cell phone. A, a person physically had to punch in those numbers. Um, most polling firms that do random digit dialing now take the effort and, and have human beings punch in those numbers so that they can, um, can sample cell phones. Um, Public opinion polling using random digit dialing, however, um, has come into, I think, a, a great deal of scrutiny in recent years because of um, its challenges in conducting election forecasting. And I, I, think I, I think this is an important thing to sort of circle back to when we're thinking about um, sampling and what sampling can tell us. And so it's worth keeping in mind that we have sort of the broad population generally, we have the target population that we are interested in, and then we have our sampling frame. And in an ideal world, our sampling frame will look like our target population. Our sampling frame is the, the pool of people from which we're able to actually draw our sample, um, but it's not guaranteed to be that way. We can make an assumption with cell phones and with phone lines in general, that more or less everybody that we're interested in is gonna be captured by this idea of generating random numbers and calling them to see who's on the other end. But our target populations might be very different um, from what that sampling frame is, is giving us. And so when we're interested in, in sort of general questions like, you know, is, is the population of, um, of the United States approving or disapproving of Joe Biden's uh, performance as president, that's sort of an open-ended question. That includes, you know, pretty much anybody who is, is here, um, but that population is different than the population of registered voters. Um, in many states, not North Dakota, notably, um, you have to register to vote. There's a, a process and paperwork and you have to like take this extra step to be on the voter rolls. Um, and so we have a method that calls up everybody, but only a subset of those people are actually registered to vote technically. And we usually find that out by just asking them, are you registered to vote? Which is kind of a weird thing to ask people in North Dakota because they might say no, because we don't need to register to vote in North Dakota, or they might say yes, even though that's not technically true, but also people may not know. They may move, um, voter registration adjusts, they can be purged from the rolls. And so that's a, that's a tricky target population to identify um, that doesn't map up neatly with cell phone numbers or telephone numbers more generally. And then there's a third population, the population that we're, well, uh, that we're oftentimes trying to um, draw our inferences about what we sometimes call likely voters, but I think it's better understood as who the heck is going to show up on election day and actually cast the ballot. And we are trying to know that ahead of time, all right, if we were just waiting for the election, we just tally the ballots. So we're trying to predict a population, a target population that literally doesn't exist yet. Um, and we're trying to project from what we can sort of discern in the present to what that future population might be. And that future population can be nudged by all sorts of things, like whether it rains um, on one day, uh, on election day, can depress turnout. It can move a person who would have otherwise been in that target population of a voter out of that target population. So it's a, it's a really difficult thing to predict above and beyond the whole challenge of what do we do with a random sample? And so um, typically the way that we determine um, whether or not a 
person belongs in that as yet non-existent target population of people who will vote, of what we call likely voters, we typically ask, um, are you registered to vote? That's self-reported. Have you done the paperwork so that if you show up on election day, you actually can cast a ballot? Um, the second thing that we ask is, have you, did you vote in the last election? We know that in general, um, voting is habitual. People do it time and time again, or they don't vote time and time again. And as long as patterns persist and people continue doing what they've done in the past, that's a, a reasonable proxy for whether or not you will actually show up on election day. However, there are situations in which you get new segments of the eligible voting population mobilized or engaged who haven't voted in past elections because they just haven't felt connected to that process. And when they show up, it's really hard to predict that that sort of change um, because one of our, our key indicators is, is invalid um, for predicting that population, or I should just say not going to work for predicting that population it might still be valid. Um, and then a third piece that we use oftentimes is a, a, a screen of how likely are you to vote. And so if a person says, nah, we typically count them as not a likely voter. If the person says, oh yeah, I'm definitely voting. Okay, we pulled you in that pool. And so if you answer, you know, you know, I'm, I'm definitely going to vote. I'm registered to vote. I voted in the last election. You typically count it in that likely voter pool. Um, but again, that's a, a forecast. That's a prediction. And I think it's worth recognizing when evaluating uh, presidential um, election polling that there's two forecasting problems. There's the survey problem with how surveys and random sampling behave normally and the volatility that can come with that. And then there's how well does our model of predicting likely voters actually work. And those two things um, can both um, create bias in the process that creates maybe more noise than people typically expect in public opinion polling. 